what makes you happy, what gets you up in the morning, and puts a big smile on your face. Is it your family, your friends, your girlfriend or your boyfriend? Maybe it's a project that you've been working on, or your job. Well, tonight, my central premise is that happiness is the holy grail of life, and that our insatiable thirst for meaning, pleasure, and fulfillment drive our every action. And yet, if you look around, so few of us ever seem to achieve long-lasting peace and contentment. Why is that? Tonight, I hope to give you an answer. But in some ways, we're all like Calvin from Bill Watterson's comic strip, Calvin and Hobbes, killing time while waiting for life to shower us with meaning and happiness. Now the quest for happiness is universal, and even though the people and projects that we might assign to our happiness differ, we're all reading from the same script. The starting point for tonight's talk is desire. Desire is that feeling of wanting something, or wishing for something to happen. We're all awash with desire every waking moment of the day, whether we're conscious of the decision to desire or not. And this is important, because if you think about happiness, happiness is linked to the fulfillment of our desires and our ability to manage our expectations. When we get the things that we want, we feel temporary joy and triumph. And when we fail at something, we feel down and dejected. If our goal is to lead happy lives, it would benefit us to spend some time unpacking our desires, discovering what's going on with these impulses that drive us from within. Now, let's start with a few observations about desire. I have five big observations. The first one is that desire is a remarkable thing. No one has to teach us how to desire. And we seem to exercise this skill endlessly without ever tiring. And even if our desires change as we grow older, we develop different tastes and preferences, we never stop wanting things. Even boredom, right? Some people say, I just don't want anything. Well, Tolstoy said once, desire or boredom is the desire for desires. Second observation, desire takes different forms. It comes in different shapes and sizes. And sometimes we want mutually exclusive outcomes. Imagine your stereotypical frat boy on a Saturday night, kicking back a six-pack of Coronas while bragging to his friends that he's going to develop a killer set of six-pack abs. Right? Sometimes our desires are at loggerheads with each other. Now tonight, I'm going to make a distinction between three broad categories. They overlap sometimes, but Bear with me for organizational purposes. First, we have biological desires. These include the desire to eat, to sleep, mate, seek pleasure, and avoid pain. Second, we have emotional desires. These include desire for feeling loved, understood, or respected. And finally, we have logical desires. This might include improving your golf swing or graduating with a PhD from Yale. Now, logical desires, oftentimes, if you think about it, are the specific people or projects to which we've attached and assigned our biological or emotional desires. Now, the third observation I wish to make tonight is that desires are not always self-directed. Take the act of falling in love. Why do we call it falling in love? Why isn't it choosing to love? Well, that's something that can be debated, but tonight I'm talking about a very specific case of love. I'm talking about romantic love, that feeling of burning passion. Well, there are certain things that we can do to make ourselves more attractive, but ultimately it's not a conscious decision or process. It's something that we discover, and sometimes it can happen instantaneously. And that's my fourth observation about desire, is that it can form and fade in an instant, sometimes without any proximate cause. The last observation I wish to make, and the most 
important one for tonight's talk is that we're insatiable. We have to look no further than the six-year-old Calvin to get a sense for what it means, the distinction between getting something and having something. Right? When you get something, it's new and exciting. When you have something, you take it for granted and it's boring. This is a well-known psychological feature of humanity. Psychologists call it the hedonic treadmill. And it's this tendency for us to revert back to a relatively stable level of happiness, regardless of whether a good or bad event has transpired within our lives. Right? Now, and the thing is, we're also like Calvin here. Happiness sometimes isn't good enough. We demand more from life. We want euphoria. And so in some ways, we're all like heroin addicts, trying desperately to get that other fix, that next fix, by fulfilling every desire that we feel within ourselves. But sometimes, it's better to quit it than to hit it. Now, I've made a few observations about desire. Where do they come from? This is still an open-ended question. But if you turn to science for answers, you start with evolutionary biology. And that discipline contends that we're hardwired to desire things that help us to survive and reproduce. So inside of us, we have an invisible incentive system. The philosopher William Irvine calls it our biological incentive system. And the reason why we have it is because our ancestors that possessed this internal incentive structure, who gravitated towards things that helped them to survive and reproduce, they were better off at passing off their genetic material. And we are the beneficiaries. Now, think of your biological incentive system like a carrot and stick that's embedded and ingrained into your system. It's not something that you can read off in words, Rather, it's this invisible structure within every single one of us. And we know it when we feel it. When we, when we get a high score on an exam, we feel joy and triumph. And when that girl or guy turns us down, we feel dejected and depressed. This is our biological incentive system kicking in, telling us how good a job we are doing at surviving and reproducing. Now, there's a outdated but useful metaphor called the triune brain and I'd like to make a connection between it and the distinctions I made between our three different types of desires. Now the triune brain metaphor contends that humans are the product of a sophisticated evolutionary process and in the order, the chronological order in which we develop things is as follows. First, as a species, we developed our reptile brain. And this corresponds to our biological imperatives to eat, to sleep, and to mate. Secondly, we developed our mammalian brains. And this is responsible for our emotions, right? feeling joy or pain and sorrow. And third, and most recently, we developed our prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for higher cognitive thought processes and abstract thinking. Now, when you combine the triune brain metaphor with the biological incentive system, it begins to shed a little bit more light on why we act the way we act. And so when we take a look at this comic strip, we, we can chuckle a little bit and see how we can go from a sweet, innocent little six-year-old crafting an innocent snowball into a cackling, a cackling maniacal genius from a Bond film, right? Clearly, we all have competing desires and impulses within ourselves at any given point in time, bubbling underneath the surface. And sometimes our biological needs or our emotional desires can hijack our system and start steering us in ways that are dictated by our biological incentive system. Now, I don't want to put all the blame for all of humanity's misdeeds on our BIS. The fact is that we can and do retain the right to, to refuse, to say no. But this involves developing willpower. Now, where does this leave us? How can we craft a purposeful and meaningful life? Are we to take Calvin's advice 
pursue money, cars, and women? Or is it just money and cars? Well, the answer is that it depends. Right? It depends upon your values, and it depends upon your understanding of the human condition. Natural selection is indifferent. It gave us our BIS, but we have a choice. We've got choices. We can become hedonists, we can follow Calvin's advice, or we can become ascetics, Buddhist monks, and try as best we can to deny our biological incentive system any sway over how we lead our lives. The third path, and the one I suspect most of us are adopting, is the middle road. We superimpose our plans for living upon the path set for us by the biological incentive system. And we understand that on some intuitive level, we must acknowledge and accept the fact that the game is rigged. We're not always going to win. So, wrapping up then, how do we live a meaningful, rewarding, happy life? Well, this is a question, a time-old question that has troubled and captivated the imagination of history's best thinkers and writers. And Henry David Thoreau, in particular, stands out to me. He once wrote in his journal that he wished to live deliberately so that when it came time to die, he would not discover that he had never lived. And he wrote these words, which I'm now going to read out loud. Happiness is like a butterfly. The more you chase it, the more it will elude you. But if you turn your attention to other things, it will come and sit softly on your shoulder. The wisdom of his words ring true today, and even though the instruments with which we pursue our happiness, be it getting a PhD, improving our golf swing, or something else, maybe having a family, while those instruments might be new and novel to us, the values upon which our success depends, honesty and hard work, faith and friendship, curiosity and courage, loyalty and love, and a little bit of luck, these things are old, but they form the price and promise of our happiness. Thank you.